The second rule is the diploma. Those who passed through the diploma uh, 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 offering uh, institutions, and then eventually they go to, uh, to university. Then there is uh, a mature entry, and these have to sit an entry exam after uh, spending time in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the work environment for uh, uh, not less than three years, and they should be 25 years of age, assuming they have uh, experience. So they sit an entry exam before they go to high school. Now, the recent one, I did participate in uh, uh, rough, uh, writing this uh, 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 program, finally, uh, this group, the government has organized this route and taken it as a fourth route. That is a route to higher education through higher education access certificate. And these are people who, um, uh, due to various reasons, did not make it through the air level street. And it also does uh, uh, take others uh, from other uh, educational levels. You have to go to the university for one year and do what uh, others would call bridging course. Meaning uh, to prepare, and it's done in a university environment to prepare candidates for uh, 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 university uh, degree. And these have added the numbers that are now uh, getting to the university. And these huge numbers uh, bring in the issue of quality. So how do we go about this and how do we uh, uh, help to maintain the standard? I go back to the regulatory uh, bodies that should set the standard uh, standards should be uh, adhered to. And so uh, that is for the moment, what I can say about the massification and the uh, quality of uh, trading in higher education. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lema. I have a question for Dr. Kevit Desai, good, and should be equitably accessible, where privatization in most cases leads to increase in tuition fees, raising the issue of affordability. Does this then directly contradict the notion that privatization of higher education is leading to increase in access? Dr. Kevitt? Oh, uh, I can pour that question to Professor Ogone. The issue about uh, private privatization of higher education when they bring in the business model, so they have to raise uh, fees while at the same time we are talking about increase of those education institutions to bring in more students. But when you raise the fees again, it means you are denying others the accessibility. So how do we balance this? Okay, thank you. I think le le let me use the Kenyan situation to explain this. Uh, also speaking to what Professor Lema just mentioned about massification, of education that um, uh, first and foremost, I need to state that private universities in Kenya, for example, do not have standard fee levels. They're expensive ones. They're also ones that are not expensive. And uh, in Kenya, we have Commission of University Education, which is the regulator for all universities, whether they're public or private. Uh, there are reasons in Kenya why, for example, some people choose to go to private universities. Usually, uh, the main reason from, from what I know is uh, the type of program that uh, the student has an interest in. Uh, the, other, the other reason is uh, uh, lack of enough space in the public universities. Um, up until last year, we, the Kenya University Colleges, um, uh, college, Kenya University Colleges Placement Service, the KUCCPS, placed both public and private students into public and private institutions. So some students 
would get into the university through the regular uh, uh, it means that they meet they meet the minimum entry point or grade for entering university and then they are placed either in a public institution or a private institution because we usually have this case where many students qualify to join university but the universities do not have the capacity to absorb them so they are placed in private universities just because of space and the logistics of accommodating them Otherwise, in Kenya, the minimum entry into university education in terms of grade is C plus, and that applies for both public and private. Just to mention something small about uh, the Kenyan situation, still speaking to massification before I come to the, the issue that was raised with Dr. Desai. Um, in Kenya, there are about three routes also to university. One is through, through high school. Kenya has changed the education system. From what used to be there, we had 844. Right now, we have something called competency based curriculum, and the pattern is 26333. Three, three. Okay, we have two pre primary levels uh, that is in pre what is called nursery school has two years the pre primary one, pre primary two. Then you get into middle school, which is grade one up to grade six. Okay, then you get into junior school which is grade 7, 8, and 9. Then you get into high school or senior school, which is grade 10, 11, and 12. Then after that, you go to tertiary colleges or universities. Okay? Now, so one route is through the senior school. The other route is through what we call module 2 or self-sponsored students. Some of these students are, are mature. They may come from wherever they, it is that they work. But before you get into university in Kenya, if you already had a certificate, you would still have to do a diploma to qualify to get into a university program. There is no uh, uh, pre-university placement exam in Kenya. Okay, You either go direct through uh, by getting a minimum grade of C+, plus, or you will need a diploma. So if you like, you can go steps slowly. Certificate, then you get a diploma, then you get into the university. Or you get the C+, plus and you get through the government uh, placement service, or you pay for yourself, but you must have the CPAS. So there are uh, three routes. But something about Kenya which uh, protects our education system from massification is that private universities are very closely regulated by the Commission of University Education because all their academic programs are accredited and they have to match the set standards by the Commission. And also, they must have the requisite level of uh, and learning materials and, uh, and human resource to, su to support the program. To the extent that, and I've told you this, that um, we, we have had public students in court, the ones that were chosen by government to join university and are sponsored by government and to private institutions. Um, on the cost of, uh, on the cost of um, university education, when, when you go to private university, I have said that it depends on the university. Some universities charge the same as, as, as public universities. Some charge much more, while some charge the difference. I know that some of the most university, uh, expensive universities in Kenya would be Strathmore or maybe United States International University of Nairobi. But there are also faith-based organization universities or universities that belong to uh, regional bodies, which may charge less if they have subsidies that students receive. So, um, it is the, the question of, of access is very heavily supported by the presence of private universities or investment in the private university sector in, in Kenya and I believe uh, elsewhere because to me uh, the existence of private universities is, is a realization of the ideal of a situation where academics, governments and private sector come together to offer a service, a social service, in this case, education. And uh, like I've said, in the case of Kenya, the, uh, you, you see aspects of the private sector investment, and there is also government support in accreditation, in placement, and, and also in quality control. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ogoni. As you have stopped at the quality control, my question is to Mrs. Ruth. Can the rating from private sectors 
push the institutions to improve their quality levels. Rating from private sectors, like a, a private sector in, uh, industry can decide to say, if you want engineers, the best students we have so far come from University of Nairobi, we rate them in this way. Is this something that can be able to push the institutions to increase their level of quality that they're giving to the students? Is Mrs. Ruth online? Uh, as you're waiting for her to come uh, online to answer that, maybe this is a question that I can direct to our chairman, who is also very involved in higher education. Would rating from the private sector push the institutions to improve the level of education that they're offering? Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me state that quality of education cannot be comparable because education is very contextualized. You cannot say Ugandan education system is better than Kenyan education or the German education system will be better than uh, another, another jurisdiction. However, there has been uh, a number of rankings uh, going on. There's the Times Higher Education Ranking. Uh, that is very, very common. But uh, the ranking also, as Professor Lemma had said, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so what is the interest of the industry actually to rank uh, this university? Uh, there, therefore, that calls for, if it is only ranking private universities, there is a risk of uh, the business element uh, coming up more or being emphasized more than quality of uh, education. Um, but of course, uh, it is uh, this debate of whether education is a public good or whether it is for private uh, social mobility. And it depends on that emphasis if a, a, a jurisdiction wants to emphasize on education as a public good then it doesn't pay to, to rank the institutions. Uh, when we are talking about regional integration, we have spoken about horizontal differentiation of institutions where they will focus on their uh, specific areas of expertise and build on that, uh, as opposed to vertical uh, differentiation. And we have seen where some of the parameters that are used to determine or to rank institutions, like uh, the age or the duration in which an institution has existed, uh, some can never be changed. Oxford has been around for 300 years. How do you change that, or 600 years, thereby giving it a permanent a prominent position? If you look at uh, another parameter of how many of its professors are, have gotten uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, for example. Uh, it, it becomes very difficult for an upcoming university to be able to afford a Nobel Peace, Peace Laureate uh, in its staff or faculty. So uh, the, the ranking, in my personal opinion, does not help much in advancing quality. I would rather that the, uh, there is more policy approach to emphasize on, uh, on access and on quality of education. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As we come to the end of this panel no, discussion. Through the, through the chair, through the chair, uh, through the chair online. Uh, my name is Ferdinand Online. I have a chance online. I don't know if there is an opportunity to do that. Can I make my observations? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Fadon Fletcher from the University of Nairobi. I need to appreciate the presentation by Ruth, uh, which was actually very, very informative in terms of uh, giving us the trends and the challenges of research at the same time, the best practices. And actually, I want to acknowledge that indeed there is a need to, there is a need to find strategies of trying to ensure uh, that we are able to improve access to funding by uh, the African researchers or by uh, the 
at the teaching institutions. And uh, my concern probably that I would want to find out what uh, would be uh, coming. What do you think, in your view, from where you sit, would be some of the practical, what would be some of the practical legal and policy strategies that can be used to uh, enhance or create long-term sustainable partnerships and collaboration between African universities and outside Africa? I want to repeat, uh, in your view, uh, from where you sit, what are some of the practical legal and policy strategies that can be employed to create long-term sustainable partnerships and collaborations between African universities and outside Africa to enhance funding for research and innovation? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I think I will call upon Professor Olemba to attempt to give us an answer. The question was about what policies can create long-term sustainable partnerships between Africa and other international universities that can help towards the research. Thank you very much. And I think from, uh, from the presentation by Ruth, I, uh, did notice this, the issue of uh, collaboration playing uh, a central role. And uh, at this note, then, I must thank Harry for uh, organizing this conference. And it's uh, one of the ways of really uh, uh, building collaboration. There was uh, the issue of data not knowing who is where and who does what. And when this is scattered all over the place, it becomes very difficult for us to really mass the, 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 um, uh, the human resource that would apply for very competitive uh, uh, research projects that would uh, apply for uh, 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 cutting edge research uh, uh, results or reports or research in, in general. And so the issue of uh, collaboration, I want to agree, is very, very central in this. And therefore, um, it helps in the issue of uh, 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 mobilizing the, the relevant human resource and expertise in the various areas that are, are, are to be focused in, uh, in research. And then the data that we need and uh, our potentials will actually be uh, uh, brought up for when uh, there's a lot of collaboration. And so I think that is the direction. I thank you very much, Professor Lemba. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? If we don't have any other questions from the audience, then I would like to give the panelists each uh, three minutes to give us their parting shots in regards to today's topic. There's a question. Oh. Thank you very much, the presenters of today and the chair of the meeting. Uh, I have one observation about the privatization of uh, higher institutions of learning. Uh, in Africa, as we all know, we have now it is becoming an inborn disease of corruption. And uh, privatization, all private uh, uh, institutions are more of uh, business. People who start private institutions, many times they are looking at uh, making money. And uh, sometimes because of this corruption, they don't have the standards to do some uh, maybe particular courses, they don't have facilities, but you find that these regulatory, regulatory bodies within the countries, they go ahead to approve them. So at the end of the day, they end up producing uh, products who are not of the quality. And at times you find the graduates of today are of this. 
they you can't handle this. This is one way of, I mean, this is the reason we are having such products on the streets because of this private business, they are after making money. And this same corruption goes like in Uganda, Professor David mentioned that to approve the research, especially by international bodies, a national council of science and technology requires that at least there is an individual from, uh, from within the country. But these people are also compromised. These uh, funders and researchers have their own interest. When they want to bring you on board, of course, they will first corrupt you. Say, we are doing this. And uh, anyway, I don't know. However much we look at privatization and maybe incorporating these different ways to improve, we have to also look at the limitations or the, the weaknesses, and we look for solutions to go to, to, to combat them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, that brings uh, one more issue about introduction of professional exams after the end for the graduates by the professional bodies. Will this be a way of ensuring that then we have the correct graduates that are being admitted to those professional bodies, like the way the Law Society of Kenya does it, so that irrespective of where you have gotten your degree, they still have a professional exams that if you do not pass, you do not get admitted. What do you think about that, Professor Gon? Oh, <clears throat> um, I want to, to dispel the fear that you might have about uh, private institutions. There are private hospitals, for example. There are private primary schools. Uh, private service providers are regulated. Uh, when you mention corruption, that has nothing to do with private institution. It, it's a systemic problem. It might affect both public and private services. But there's nothing inherent about private institutions that make them corrupt or make them uh, amenable to corrupt, corrupt the practices with regulators. Yeah? Uh, let me give you an example. The best hospital in Kenya today is probably a private hospital. I do not know about Uganda. If you have very good private hospitals here. Uh, if you uphold the acceptable or high standards of service, then things are just fine. And this is why regulators exist. When it comes to professional bodies, it depends on the discipline. Lawyers have their own, doctors have their own, and so on. Whether, pro whether public or private, they are. So, um, I do not want us to worry about private universities and, and thinking that they will necessarily uh, uh, give us poor education standards just by virtue of the fact that they are private. Yeah. Because the people who learn in those universities and the people who teach in those universities are not private registration. Otherwise, the human beings that end up there are public people, isn't it? Or do we have private people? They are public. So in my opinion, do not fear about that. We have regulators in Kenya. We have the Commission of University Education. Here in Uganda, I think we have National Commission of National Council of Higher Education. It is their responsibility to uphold standards. If they go to the extent of accrediting programs for implementation in private institutions, only to, to realize that these institutions do not, do not uphold the standards, then they have a right to deregister them isn't it? Already commissioned their programs. So there is no problem there. And I do not think that this is inherent about uh, private. It is not something typical of private institutions. And uh, from my over 20 years experience teaching in the university, I've come to learn some very interesting things. When, when you meet a student who graduated from a public university, or another one who graduated from a, pub, a private university, Sometimes it is their own capabilities as individuals. If you put the institution aside a bit, you realize that it depends on how dedicated they were to get the most out of the programs that they went through. Not exactly the name of the institution. I have actually met idiots from the University of Nairobi. Yeah? 
but have also met very brilliant fellows from some university that you might dismiss. But when you listen to them, you see, you see something. Which means that it is also the responsibility of the students to make maximal use of the programs they go through. This, this is what I think, honestly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's another question. Thank you, moderator. It may not be a question, but something to think about. Uh, let's first of all thank Professor Ogone on that uh, dispelling of the fears of uh, mediocre pro products from private institutions. Uh, it is good that we have those uh, national regulatory bodies and we have even evidenced some institutions being closed because they didn't measure to the standards. So we have a, a trust in those regulatory bodies to ensure that both private and uh, public uh, institutions are to the standard. We've been talking about uh, research and the research funders. And it was interesting when we said that uh, government are not funding and the, the funders it is due uh, to start researching. And someone once said that we are living on project proposals, both by higher institutions and by government. We are all on proposal writing. But if at all the trend remains like this, I think that's what we need to interrogate ourselves about. Why should we only compete to the proposed research areas designed by the funders? We as high institutions, can we also interrogate ourselves in the community engagement, deal with our communities and come out with areas that are worth researching and we present this for funding. Why should we only wait and say which areas are being funded and we move to that? I think we need now also as the nations try to make national development goals, we need also to be interested in that and we see where we can contribute to new knowledge. And if we do that, Maybe even the government will see a reason of sparing some funds for uh, uh, doing those researches. But if at all we wait for the private sector to tell us wh where they are stuck and we see we can contribute, then we are going to be irrelevant to the whole process of development and uh, transformation. So let us also, as higher institutions, go ahead and look at uh, the communities, look at our nations, look at the problems facing us and design research areas where we can then attract funding. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend Father, for those uh, parting shots. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Lemba, if you can have your before we close. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have the following really to, to bring forth in this as far as uh, 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 massification or uh, privatization of uh, higher education is concerned. What I see and I recommend is uh, uh, strong regulatory bodies because uh, mass education now is inevitable. Our populations are growing at rates that are much, much uh, 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 higher than the rate at which governments are investing in, uh, in, in education. And to really keep with this, private sector should be allowed to continue, but regulations should be in place and uh, to follow this up. And the other bit is uh, the move to ODL is very important for the uh, for massification of uh, uh, education. And this we cannot do away with. We saw what COVID-19 did to us and turned 
many institutions into this, and those that were ready continued, those that were not ready uh, actually lagged behind. We had a terrible situation here where there, there were multiple semesters within a year to really cope up so that, you know, the uh, students catch up and they're able to uh, regularize. Actually, this semester that, you know, went back to, to the normal uh, systems. So ODL has come and is really uh, to stay here and to, to support uh, um, privatization and the uh, massification of education. And the, on the side of research, um, it is important that research agendas are set by uh, by states, by governments, by regional governments, by um, uh, uh, universities, and by different uh, organizations as to how to direct our focus, because being spread all over the place may be very tricky and the, the impact may not easily be uh, realized. And so on this note, for example, a Harry would set, you know, this, uh, this is our, uh, research agenda for this period, and this is what we want to uh, 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 focus on, and that direction would really guide into uh, 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 gathering all our energies to what would be uh, impactful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lemba. Professor Goni, your parting shots? Yeah, in the spirit of regional integration, I would wish to uh, reiterate the words of uh, Dr. Chikas of, of Joss University that we need to activate our networks uh, to create a fellowship, a community of people with shared goals and interests. And maybe as uh, members of AHERI, we need to create a fellowship of, of participants, those of us who have been involved in this debate, to have an alumnus of AHERI so that we work together and we share goals and we share communication so that we know what we will do next. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. As we come to the end of this panel, my sincere gratitude to all the panelists, the audience, both physical and virtual, for making a Harry 2023 conference possible. I was your moderator, Victoria Odor, Director of Corporate and Communications at Africa Higher Education Research Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the panel deserves a better round of applause as they stand up for a photo moment. Um, we are transitioning into our closing ceremony and I want to thank our online audience uh, for the robust conversation. Uh, time has really moved and uh, I think it's because of um, how you are passionately engaging uh, and also addressing the issues that we were discussing. Uh, for now, I would like to invite our Institute Director uh, for, um, uh, to guide us or take us through the communique, as well as um, close for us uh, this important session. Karibu. Indeed, it has been an exciting two days. And uh, just as it was warming up, it is time to come to a close. And I believe uh, that is the essence of anything that is good. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bring the AHERI 2023 conference to a close, I am deeply inspired by the wealth of knowledge shared and the spirited discussions that have taken place over these enlightening days. Our collective exploration of the pivotal role that higher education, research, and innovation play in promoting regional integration has illuminated new paths forward. In the diverse perspectives woven here, we've discovered that education is not merely a means to acquire knowledge, but a transformative force capable of shaping a united and harmonious future for our beloved continent from fostering cultural understanding to driving collaborative research initiatives, 
the power of education to transcend borders has been a recurrent theme. The commitment displayed by our esteemed speakers, presenters, and participants to advancing education for a collective prosperity of Africa has been truly commendable. It is clear that our institutions are not just centers of learning, but vital catalysts for positive change. By adapting curricula to embrace diversity, encouraging cultural uh, collaborations, and harnessing the potential of research and innovation, we pave the way for a future where regional integration is not just an idea, but a reality. On the conference highlights, under the various themes, under the policy framework for promoting research, innovation, and enterprise, the role of higher education to produ produce knowledge uh, has to shift to changing mindsets. Higher education institutions need to be well-funded and appropriately governed in order to function properly. The higher education curriculum needs to be connected to development agendas of each country. And in point, we have the agenda towards 2063, uh, where the Africa where we want. The oper operationalization of, inter of regional integration needs to be promoted for international markets with common competencies. There is need for collaboration and interlinkages in institutions of higher learning in order to achieve regional integration. Further, there is need to redefine assessment tools to include the African context in defining our performance. We need to increase contribution of Africans uh, into research from the current 2% to be globally relevant. In the face of massification of higher education, we also need to develop systems and structures to ensure quality and access. We need to increase research on food security and economic resilience with localized solutions across the regions. On building research capacity in the East African region, the research, research is a systemic process and African countries need to realize the value of research in the region and avoid silo research approach in higher education institutions. We need to support private-public partnerships, which need to be embraced by both uh, across, across the region by the industry, by government, and the academia. Policymakers and investors need to be involved in forums and discussions in the promotion of regional integration and uh, such as AHERI conferences, uh, which we have gone through. Under the solutions to regional higher education challenges, organized mobility systems will build capacity of specialized skills and enable transfer of knowledge. Higher education institutions need to promote skills of the future, such as leadership and project management. Internet connectivity needs to be diverse in order to accommodate different languages and marginalized, marginalized groups, including persons with disabilities. Under the action-oriented academia, industry collaboration and cooperation, African culture promotes a sense of community and association. We need to build this in our approach to research. Alumni networks are important in regional integration, and they bring people from diverse cultural and regional backgrounds together. Alumni networks need to pay attention to the needs and challenges of the institutions of higher learning and engage with communities as well as governments in coming up with local solutions. Under the funding research and innovation in higher education, which has just concluded, institutions of higher learning need to promote more efforts to, ask, uh, to embrace dynamism in curriculum. There is need to collect data to support policy, 
as no policy is possible without data. Institutions need to have systems in place in order to track the funds allocated to them, in, in a, being accountable to their sponsors, but more importantly, to uh, the potential uh, funders. Value propositions of higher education institutions need to be strengthened for visibility so as to attract funding. Uh, we have been to have an economic summit for politicians and other leaders on fundraisers and to convince governments to in inject more funding in uh, research. Uh, the final point that was spoken about on massification is to create systems where there will be, which will guide privatization of high Recording education. Recording stopped. In the sense that uh, the demand for higher education is high and the governments cannot support them on their own. As we leave this conference, let us carry with us the passion ignited here and translate it into action. Let the partnerships forged and insights gained be the seeds of a more interconnected, prosperous and harmonious Africa. The journey towards regional integration through higher education is ongoing and each one of us plays a vital role in shaping this narrative. Thank you for your unwavering commitment, your invaluable contributions and your dedication to the advancement of higher education, research, and innovation in Africa. Together, let us stride confidently into the future, where the fruits of our collaborative efforts manifest in a region that stands united, inspired, and empowered. The next AHERI conference will be held in Kigali and with the theme AI Paradigm opportunities for research and development in Africa. I take this opportunity to invite you to Kigali, Aheri Kigali 2024. With those remarks, uh, we come to a close of this conference. Uh, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to personally uh, express my gratitude to all the attendants, all the uh, presenters, and indeed the team uh, from Aheri that put this uh, together, uh, you have all been very wonderful. God bless you and God bless Africa.